So the, our first question is about success. Um, and maybe I'm asking the impossible. Can you define think tank success in, uh, in less than three minutes? <laughs> Can you share with us a real life example from a developing country context of what think, think tank success looks like? Perhaps the most significant success that you've, you've been part of or you've experienced in the, in the last year or two. And please d describe it in a way that would convince someone who's not uh, a true believer. Now I'll ask the, um, all, of, all five of you to, uh, to have a go at uh, the first question and then I'll ask uh, later questions to some of you. So let's kick off with Goran. Uh, thank you very much, and uh, thank you for having this, uh, this opportunity. And also with my loud voice, I have to break the ice now. Okay, um, uh, it, it's hard to choose. There are many examples. We, we support uh, roughly 80 uh, think tanks each year, so it's, it's a lot. Let me, let me uh, do a very, very brief thing. Uh, a think tank in Macedonia who has uh, basically uh, used uh, a window of opportunity and pushed uh, uh, the fee of privately managed compulsory pensions, uh, or what the economists call the second pillar, from 8.5% to 2.5%. Uh, a think tank in Serbia that has uh, basically uh, followed the civil oversight or created a need for civil oversight of a military in a society where actually military ruled uh, together with the dictator until, until 2001. Um, Azerbaijan, uh, a think tank uh, who has calculated al alternative inflation rate in an in a economy uh, which is oil rich but also data poor and when the government has consistently pushed out uh, an, an inflation rate that has been half of the, of the, re of the real one. Um, Bulgaria, uh, 12 think tanks, 150, 200 people, basically the single body of transfer for the, the, the really hordes of uh, external experts that flooded the country in the late 90s, beginning, beginning of, of, two, of 2000s, in absence of a competent government to process the knowledge that was coming from abroad. Um, what are all these things? I mean, you have uh, se several key things. The first one is basically using a window of opportunity uh, where to help something where for the large population. You know, the pensions. When, you, when, when the fee really decreases, you have a very tangible benefit. And basically to fight against capture of various experts' commissions by, by the business. What's the second example? A key tenet of a democracy where you have actually think tanks uh, addressing an issue which won't be so common to the general population but is so essential as we can witness in so many countries today of controlling, controlling the, uh, the military. The third example in Azerbaijan, the government will never change their official policy. Uh, this is, they have a very good reason why. It's a very authoritarian government. But what, what the uh, uh, think tank provides is a knowledge that actually spins into the, into the public space and then it becomes actually more used than what the government does. Ironically enough, government uses the real rate for their own budget calculations. But the knowledge provision even without uh, transferring to the space. And the last one, uh, providing a power of example when you uh, develop a country scene that actually you could have think tanks as a, as a body and as an important actor in a society and policy process. Yeah. Thank you very much, and uh, no need for me to cough that time. So, <laughs> Jean, can you match that? Can you give us your examples of success? Yes. Well, for us at the IEA, our view is that think tanks, a think tank's role is to undertake research and use that research to inform and influence policy. And therefore, we measure success by our ability to influence policy making in Ghana. And we go about this by identifying a problem or a policy gap, undertaking rigorous research on the issue, and then we mount a sustained advocacy program. We use our roundtable discussions, our radio and TV discussions, and you know, some media, some press briefings and publications to influence and to create national consensus on the issue. And once we do this, we are able to obtain buying and ownership from key stakeholders. And when we've gone through all these processes and our outputs have been accepted and implemented by government, we consider that a success. And one of the major successes of policy influencing in our recent uh, work was the drafting of the Presidential Transition Bill. We undertook an audit of Ghana's uh, democratic institutions in 2007, and we realized that the absence of a transition blueprint was threatening to undermine our democracy and derail our development process. So we identified and recognized this as a problem, and we undertook rigorous research on this and went on to prepare 
a draft bill. Once we are done that, we invited key stakeholders, mainly the political parties and some civil society organizations to discuss the issue. And we had a series of meetings with them, had some TV radio discussions, and we were able to build national consensus around the issue. And I think one key result of this was that the presidential candidates of the 2008 debate, uh, 2008 election, all accepted and pledged their support to the bill. The result was that the president in his 2009 State of the Nation address pledged his commitment to pass the bill into law. However, it was not until 2010 that the bill was introduced in parliament. All this time, we mounted our advocacy. We used various strategies of meetings with parliamentarians, workshops with, with them. You know, we were introducing articles into the media, the newspaper, to generate debate. And finally, the bill was passed into law in March 2012. But I would like you to permit me to quote the president in his State of the Nation address. And he said that the program of the Institute of Economic Affairs demonstrates what a spirit of wanting to work together can achieve. As a result of their collaborative effort, a multi-partisan presidential transition bill to regulate the process of transition from one government to another, and which I hope will put an end to the acrimony and bitterness that have characterized past transitions have been agreed upon. Because of its multi-partisan nature, I'm sure that Parliament would have no difficulty passing it. The bill has been passed into law in March, and for us, this is what we consider success. Thank you. So would anyone like to appreciate that success? <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay, I think we'll go to another think tank and then a policymaker and then a donor. So, Shaker, would you like to answer the, the same question? Thank you, Peter, and thank you for having me here on this panel. I actually want to start by questioning the premise of uh, your question. Uh, and the question was, uh, uh, can you give a real-life example from a developing country context of what think tank success looks like and how can you convince a skeptic? So what's so different about a developing country context? If in the developed country context, we don't question the role of, uh, of Brookings or a CEPR or a C CGD, uh, I hope Nancy's here, uh, or uh, um, you know, the Heritage Foundation or RAND or any of these, uh, I don't think there's much of a debate about their role in society. So why would we want to question the role of think tanks in a developing country context. So I think that that's worth thinking about a little bit, and maybe that's something that we can discuss. But going to your question, um, uh, I think there are just so many examples that it's hard to choose uh, from at least the Indian scene, and I won't talk about NCER, uh, but I do want to highlight two institutions, uh, and you said not to be soft, so I'm going to be very direct and personal, and one of the individuals happens to be in this audience, so I hope he, he won't mind. So the first example is the Center for Policy Research in Delhi, um, which is a TTI grantee, indeed uh, a member of, I think, the, the IDRC board as well, who heads the, this is all truth in advertising. Um, so the Center for Policy Research started out uh, back in the, uh, I think, the late 60s uh, and was funded by a number of different institutions uh, and has made a remarkable dent, I think, on thinking in Indian policy circles on uh, private confidential whisper in your ears kind of advice, of which we don't hear much outside, but I know it happens. Uh, and just in terms of, at this current stage, being one of the most desirable destinations for any serious uh, economist, political science uh, scientist, environmental uh, uh, person, uh, legal experts to converge to. And I think it represents, to my mind, one of the highest ideals that one could aspire to in uh, thinking about what think tanks can do. It has amazing independence, despite having core support from the government, and it pays for it from time to time. Uh, it has a very strong board of uh, uh, directors who both nurture and protect this independence. Um, I think it 
does an amazing job on the Indian scene today. So that's one. The second one is the National Institute of Public Finance and Policy, uh, which unfortunately did not make the DTI grade, mm -hmm. and uh, yet represents, I think, one of the finest public finance institutions globally. Um, and within the very difficult context of bad data, of uh, the uh, different levels of political interference in public finance at the federal level, at the state level, uh, it does an amazing job of uh, taking analytical tools to the data to be thinking about taxation and other issues, to be considering public economics more broadly, service delivery issues in recent years, and has made an amazing contribution, I think, to the better understanding of what public finance can or cannot do for the welfare of the poor uh, and for good statesmanship, statecraftship, and good governance. So I think that's a very important example. NCR itself, well, it's 56 years in existence. I, I notice it's the oldest uh, think tank in this assembly. Uh, mm -hmm. It's been around, it's very close to government, yet receives very little support from government. So I guess just its longevity must say something about the value it has for policymakers in India. With that, I'll stop. Okay, thank you. Would anyone challenge Shaker's contention that NCAAER is the oldest think tank in town? Or, uh, <laughs> okay, we'll, we'll believe that. Okay, so That's over great. to the, the policymaker. Lewis, would you like to give us your, uh, your take on, on what success looks like? Yes, uh, thank you. Um, I think if I can start from where a statement by Trevor Manuel that the products of think tanks need to find a home. And I think for many think tanks, um, the easiest would be to say we have influenced policy. But I think over the past two days, most of us have come to the conclusion that we are in a very complex business and that there are very many players. That it might be very difficult for one think tank to work out and see the influence to, to, to policy. So, yes, influence to policy is one of the measures that uh, one can take as a success. But I think we should be looking at so many other things. Even the fact that uh, a think tank is invited to a conference like this is success. You must be doing something right <laughs> to survive the vetting process of TTI and uh, qualify for repeated financing from TTI. You must be doing something right. Uh, two is that the mere fact that you are contributing to public goods, having publications out there in the public, I think should also be taken as, uh, as success. And I will share with you my own experience when I was at uh, the African Development Bank. We had the African Economic Outlook, and whenever I went to the board, they would ask me, well, you, yes, you have, you have a report, yes, but what's its impact? But the fact that we had a report to us was initially success. So we had to go back and be very innovative to, to convince our board that it was having an impact. And you always start looking for citations as an impact. But citation, maybe one is cited in The Guardian, another one in some gutter press. So what do you, what, how do you report back? Do you just say, yes, uh, the citations were 20, or do you say uh, five in The Guardian and one in whatever press? So, so citations are the same. I think those who are in, from university face the same problem when you start talking about uh, uh, citation. But one other powerful tool uh, is a feedback. You need from time to time to do surveys. <laughs> you need to go back to those people you take as your stakeholders to find out whether they read your whatever publication, did it have an impact? And it is not something that you can do only one time. It is something that has to be repeated. When you come up with a report, you, you must go out there maybe in the first three months, find out whether people actually saw the report. Did it have an impact? Go back after six months. And that's what we, were, we tried to do with uh, the African uh, economic outlook. That feedback is a, uh, 
a very uh, powerful tool of assessing the success of, uh, of a think tank. And it shows that people are looking at the report and maybe influencing their thinking, but not necessarily looking for the policy outcomes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Stefan, as a donor, a, new, a newbie donor. <laughs> well, um, I mean, it, at, um, at one level, the examples you've given us and uh, the three of you have been describing, of course, they do, they do show success, and, and it's, it's definitely at that level. It is at the level of real influence, not necessarily in changing policy. It could also be in shaping debates and contributing to the, to the debates in a, in a real and meaningful way. Of course, the way to define that is going to be very context-specific. All think tanks will be quite different. They will have different bases of connectivity to political mm. leaders, to public opinion, and so on. And so it will always uh, look, look very different. And of course, from a donor who's been pushing you know, results-based frameworks, it poses incredible measurement challenges and how to actually be going to, to assess this. And I'm, I'm very conscious that, you know, even the mere premise that we will want to try to define and measure success will be contested by many of you. And indeed, it's been contested over the last few days by, by many of you in, in private and public conversations. So I want to turn it slightly differently and say, well, for, for us as a donor, what would success look like? Well, I would say, you know, um, impress us. Being impressed by what you've achieved is something there. And I think there's at least two elements that I would like to emphasize. Show within your context, within your specific context, how you've identified and how you've I, I noticed windows of opportunities. It's to do with the questions you ended up asking and the way you've gone about it. In each context, it will be different. There will be different windows of opportunities. It's crucial for a think tank to step into that space. Don't be just you know, crying wolf in a space where nobody is listening. Uh, mm -hmm. Finding the place where you can be listened to the kind of topics and issues. So that, that's one thing. We can be really impressed by that if you, if you do that. How you proceeded with that in that process and the questions you've asked. The second thing is how we will be impressed is if the contribution you make is truly evidence-based. It's based on a, on a consolidated set of knowledge, not just on opinion-based research, opportunistic research that simply you know, makes a lot of noise, but actually in due course is actually shown not to be based on strong sets of evidence. And I would say these two things, picking your windows of opportunities, and actually have the honesty that everything you do is really of high quality and, and, and knowledge-based and evidence-based, that, that's something that would impress us. Mm -hmm.